with me. So let's just see. So let's see if this has worked. Let's see. I think I figured it out, dear ones. Let's see. I just want to see. I think it worked. How are we doing, guys? Let me know. Let me know if this worked, guys. Just send me a shout out because I think it's actually working now. So, oh, hi, Lisa. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sticking with me. As you know, I'm learning as I go. I throw spaghetti up against the wall. And this whole live streaming thing is very, very new to me. Um, but I will get better at it as I go. I guess it's like riding a bicycle. At least I hope so. I really hope so. So hi everybody, I just want to say hello to Diane, hi Betsy, hello Katie, hi um, Shelly, hi, thank you so much Deanna, good old technical technical difficulties, absolutely, I just want to give everybody a shout out, woohoo, hi Shelly, can't wait to see you soon Shelly, I'm really excited about that, um, thank you, you know, um, I just had a, uh, hi Nia, hi Nia, awesome. I just had a live stream video, I just did a live stream um, for my 12, 12 week group, my new 12 week group. Those of you who are in the first group, group know what that was like. And um, one of the things that I said yesterday in the live stream was that it never ceases to amaze me to realize how much love and how much patience and how much understanding and how much forgiveness oozes out of an abused adult child. Even a child, a small child, it never ceases to amaze me to observe how much love comes out of a child that has very rarely been given love. Isn't that amazing? So, like I'm reading some of your comments and they're just like, don't worry about it, it's good, it's so fun, it's awesome, don't worry about it. You know, even, um, see, Hi, Emoki, Yelena, how are you? Um, oh, thank you, you like my shirt, Yelena. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle, namaste. You're, she says that your streams are really helping me break free from my situation. I'm so happy about that. Sharon, hi. Oh, thank you, Shelly. I'm glad you like it. Bethany, I'm so glad you're alive right now. It's only 2 p.m. and I've already been exposed to so much dysfunction when I stepped out of my house for a few hours. Um, Eleanor said, yep, I agree. I know what you miss, you, you miss so give it to other people. So, um, like I was saying, you know, it's, it's really important that we recognize in ourselves how loving we are to other people because we don't usually, and I just want to switch screens for a minute, we don't usually validate enough in ourselves that we are loving and how much love and how much forgiveness comes out of us in spite of how little love goes inside of us. I just think that is just an amazing phenomenon, you know, and I think that might be what separates us from narcissistic people or narcissists, is that in spite of how abused we were, we didn't go to the dark side, you know, we, in spite of how negative things have been in our life and how much lack we've experienced, we are still standing there shining our light and giving, 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 giving. so that is really amazing and I just want all of you to appreciate appreciate that in yourself pay attention to how kind you are and how empathetic you are and how easy you are to forgive people because that matters that represents the light what we are trying to do on the healing journey is we're trying to learn how to exert our own boundaries so that we don't diminish our light or kind of like drain our batteries because we're codependent and because we're so giving. So just a note about empathy and codependency, a YouTube viewer wrote me and, and asked me, she said, are all empaths codependent? And I said, no, not all empaths are codependent, but empaths are prone to codependency because they feel so deeply for other people. And it's very easy to get caught up in feeling like your job is to rescue somebody. So it's never our job to rescue others. We can support, we can send love and light, we can shine love and light. But our job really is more of a, a, a encourager 
than it is for us to actually swoop in and take care of somebody's issues. It's sort of like the difference between, I mean, imagine having a baby and every time your baby fell, you rushed in to pick the baby up. Those of you in my coaching program, you've heard me say this in, in the videos and in the live streams where it is absolutely essential that when a baby falls down, a baby learns to pick herself up or himself up because in the learning to pick herself up, she is developing and he is developing crucial muscles and, and ligaments and tendons are getting stronger and stronger and stronger and coordination is getting more precise in learning how to actually get themselves back up and stand erect again. So we all say, oh, it's a shame, shame she fell. It's okay that she fell. First of all, she's going to learn how to fall, right? Now that she knows the next time, she'll use her hands to prevent herself, her face from hitting the ground. So when we come in, imagine, imagine every time a baby fell, a mother went or a father went and refused to let the kid to get up on her own two legs or her own two arms. So it works the same way emotionally, whereas we are not supposed to take care of and figure other people's problems out. Think about this, dear one. When we are figuring our own problems out, neural pathways are being created to the prefrontal cortex and the neocortex. So it's really, really important that we understand and we observe when other people are in pain because codependents want to rush in and fix everything. Why? Because we think we're not good enough and we think if we take care of somebody who's sick or ill, then they'll need us. And if they need us, they'll never leave us. And if they need us, they'll, see, they'll be able to mirror worth back to us. And, but that's not what happens. What ends up happening is we attract people who are ill, who are sick, who we think, oh, I'm just going to love him so much and I'm going to show him what real love is. And then he's going to love me forever and ever and ever and ever. No, it doesn't work that way. And this is why, when you don't love yourself, your vibration is one of lack, it's not one of abundance. So you're going to attract somebody who was very willing to take your love, but cannot flow love back to you. It's a matter of vibrational frequencies. So now, you have to understand that that's, we have to fix that, correct, that thinking in our heads. And when we correct the thinking in our heads, and we make those connections, then we, come, we grow up out of the amygdala and the hippocampus, we connect to the prefrontal cortex, and we connect to the neocortex where higher thinking happens, and we evolve our brain. And that's what this journey really is about. So many of you, we, I have a woman in my program now in the um, September 2016 class who shared and said that she spent over $50,000 $50, looking for peace and harmony, following people all around the globe. And she never realized that it was a matter of learning how to think about self properly and connecting to the self properly. Now, what we, what we end up doing is we end up seeking our salvation outside of ourselves. Now, that's another thing that we have to think about. I just want to look at your comments. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Eternally Born. Hi, Misty. Okay, that's great. So, Jennifer, hello. Depersonalization cure. Lisa Bay, thanks for the stream. Thanks. Hey, Bay, you're welcome. So, um, and Mary Kay, thank you so much. My friend and, and client just texted me and said everything's good with the live stream, so I'm really, really happy about that. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the idea of separation. Because my coaching program, my books, and my live streams, and my YouTube videos are all really, if you pay attention to your ones, um, they're about one thing, and that is healing this concept of separation. So um, we are healing this idea that we're separate from the self. Now, where does this idea of separation come from? So the idea of separation comes from, in those of us who are wounded, it comes from this feeling that we're separate and not good enough for our mothers and our fathers. It's this idea that we've been pushed away and abandoned by the people that we love. So we've been, we haven't been enfolded. We haven't been pulled in. We haven't been seen psychologically, mentally, and emotionally, right? So there is this separation. Here we are. 
you know, here we, go, here we go, we're separated from the people that we love. So there is this feeling of separation between us and the person we love. So then those of us who are born into, you know, families that have religion and have faiths that they are, hi Sharon, that they follow, hi Tara, what ends up happening now is there's another break, depending on what religion you your family practices. But for me, I was raised Roman Catholic, and God was out there. God wasn't in me. You know, God was out there. And so, again, here's another break in this idea that we are separate. Um, and so, again, we have to pay attention to the idea of separation, because that's really what wounds us, the sense that we're separate. So when you feel separate from the people that you love, you feel blocked off from love. And that's because you are a conduit of love energy. You're born of love and light. And what's supposed to happen when you're born is you're supposed to have this infinity loop of love come from mother to child and mother to mother to child, child to father and back again and siblings and grandma and grandpa. And if there's an ex if someone outside of the family doesn't really like you, that's okay because you have this this constant current of love, between, especially mother, mother and child, because mother is like the extension cord to the child. So that's, if that happens, you're all good. So you also mirror neurons in terms of the brain. Mirror neurons get turned on. Mother says I'm good, I feel worthy. Now my brain is able to, my psyche is able to develop some concept of self. When you feel alienated from the people that you love, you feel alienated and blocked from love. You can't flow love and you're not receiving love. So you feel separate. There's this dark energy. There's this boom. You talk about the heart chakra. You talk about the root chakra. You talk about energy blocks. It's because love is not being permitted to flow. And love is supposed to flow. And when you heal deep enough, what will happen is you will go out and about in your world and you will love everything. No matter what's happening around you, you're going to... These days, I send love to trees. I send love to concrete. I don't care. You know, I just bless this and bless that. And because I've tapped into the stream of abundance, as Esther Hicks would say, I've tapped into the true source of love, and that is the creator within me. Because I've healed this idea of separation. I know that I was never I'm never separate. I just want to say hello to a couple of people. Thanks, Mary Kay, for saving my ass. Um Rollickin, I'm a fan for over a year. I plan to join your program. You helped me you helped me leave my abusive ex boss and get a better job in a positive environment. Namaste, that makes me very happy. And we're all part of that that you know, we love that. And we're all part of that. Greetings from South UK, greetings from the UK. Thanks for this opportunity to join others on this journey on self discovery. Namaste. Luz, greetings from Austria. Um, Jennifer says she never had mother love. So, um, Hey, we have an empath in Ireland. That's awesome. Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Fiona. Awesome. So let me go back. So Jennifer, Jennifer Griffin said that she never had a mother's love. So I know so much about you, Jennifer. I already know that you felt like you weren't good enough. I already know that you felt, you felt like people just didn't like you in general. I know that you felt like there was some eternal flaw. Give me a shout out if I'm right. Um, I know that you, you never felt good enough for men. I know that you've attracted poor friendships and poor men. I know that you may have suffered from either eating issues, overeating, spending. There's some type of distraction that you take part of because you never felt your mother's love. So let's break it down. For those of us who, greetings from Germany, that's awesome. Um, greetings from London, awesome. Love this. Yes, dear ones, if you could just let me know where you're coming from because that, that really... When we start to think about how many light bodies there are watching this live stream together at one time, we are think about how we are raised in the vibrations of the planet. That is just phenomenal. Um, Tia, hi, how are you? Um, so let's talk about what happens when we feel this break. So when a child feels a break, DC, hello, Texas, hello. I'm sorry, I keep Montana, Sweden, love it. I'm just going to spend a couple of more minutes talking about where you guys are from. Tara wrote, I love that so many people around the world are here in one moment. Namaste. We are so connected. Yes, we are. Oh, Jennifer just said, yes, you were right. Okay, getting back to Jennifer. I'm sorry. Ohio, Northern Ontario, Arizona. Awesome. 
Michigan, Montana, love it. California, awesome. So it's Portland, Oregon, Alberta, Canada. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. I wish I could just hug each and every one of you. One day, when we, when we take the 12-week program on the road, that's when I'm going to get to hug you guys. Um, so let's... Denmark, Seattle, Turkey. It's so cool. Russia, a Russian from MI, Michigan. Hi, Elena. I'll see you too soon, too. Uh, I'm in Fermi Region 6, East, East Texas. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Greece. Awesome. Hello from Greece. Um, so, yes, we're going on the road. So now, I'm, gonna, I'm getting distracted by the comments. And I love, I love talking. And South Africa. Oh, my God, that's awesome. All right, so now, let's get back to Jennifer, someone who never, it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. If you felt cut off from your mother's love, what ends up happening is energetically, okay, get it, get this through your heads. As a baby, you don't have the cognitive ability to understand I'm being disconnected from mom, right? But you have an amygdala that knows that you're supposed to be connected to mom. And so when you're not connected to mom, what happens? Bells and whistles go off, you know? Your body doesn't feel, you're, you are wired, right, genetically, for tactile stimulation. You're wired to hear shh. That's why white noise is so soothing to babies and even adults. Shh, shh. We are literally wired to have those sounds soothe us. We know this scientifically. So when these things are not happening, our body, bells and whistles are going off. That's, Freud calls that tension. So now there's tension in the being, right? I call it anxiety. You can be three hours old and suffer from anxiety, and that ain't your fault. That's not your fault. So if things are happening, you know, in your surroundings and you're not having, you know, chest-to-chest -chest contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, and you're not hearing your mother's heartbeat, and you're not hearing your mother's voice, you can be traumatized. You can suffer from anxiety at three hours old, three minutes old. So it's really, really, really important that we begin to backtrack and appreciate what happened to us when we were children. So now when you don't have your mother's love, that's what happens very early on. So now, you're two, you're three, you're four, you're a little bit more cognitive. So now your mind's got to start making sense of these confusing situations, which is why I want to talk about backwards realization, backwards, backwards rationalization, opposed to rationalization, because backwards rationalization is a defense mechanism of the psyche that happens when we are presented with something in the now that is confusing and we can't make sense of it. So the mind's got to make sense of whatever just happened. So, you know, um, one of our guilty pleasures in our house is that we watch The Housewives. I know, I know, I know. But it's so interesting because I'm seeing all these dynamics that were present in my own life experiences happen on reality television, which is far from reality television. But for those of you all over the world, what we have here in the States is called Housewives of whatever, Atlanta or Housewives of New York, whatever. And the, the Bravo television, this cable show, actually follows the housewives around and listens to their, their nonsense and their arguing and, you know, their relationship dynamics get played out on television. And just recently, um, I wanted to use this as an example because it just drove the, the, the uh, it just drives the point home. Luann, who is a New York housewife, her fiance was caught cheating on her. And, oh, that's so funny. People are, they get, you get it. You guys know what I'm talking about. Luann's, this woman, Luann's boyfriend, fiance, was seen kissing another woman. So Bethany Frankel caught this, this man, or her friend caught Luann's boyfriend kissing another woman. When Luann was presented with this information, Luann, you just, I would just, I watched her go into backwards rationalization. She said, well, we had a fight, and he was drunk. So Luann was first confronted with negative information, which her mind was having a really tough time digesting. And to make it okay, she went, I couldn't believe it. It was like, oh my God, look at this. She went right into, well, we had a fight that night, and he was drunk, and it was an ex. So that's backwards rationalization. That's what the mind does to make an event that has already happened make sense and make it okay. We have to be so careful when we're doing that. 
I know that I use backwards rationalization all the time, and that's why I ended up married for 13 years, and I was miserable, because let's say after an argument with my ex-husband, you know, after the argument ensued, I would end up saying, well, that's because I'm a pain in the ass. We had a fight because I'm a pain in the ass, and I, do, I am kind of intense, and even my mother says I'm a pain in the ass, so my mind could not wrap its its fingers around the idea that once again we had an argument and it didn't go anywhere nothing got resolved and so when he would leave or i would go off into the bedroom or i would go take a shower and cry myself in the shower cry, cry to myself in the shower what was happening was in my head it was so disconcerting that once again we were on, on we were not on the same page my psyche i can see it now and this is what codependents do I made it okay. I was like, well, things will get better tomorrow, or things will eventually get better. Every marriage sucks. Nobody's really happy. So here came all this backwards rationalization, and that is really the dynamic that allowed me to stay in a dysfunctional relationship. Now, let's talk about why the brain would do that. This is just my theory. I think as codependents, we fear rocking the boat. So that's our fear response, right? Our, our mind is already afraid to rock the boat. I think that goes back to the fear of abandonment, the fear of being wrong, the belief systems, which I always say is our programming, that tells us that we are wrong. So if we ha have a fear of rocking the boat and then we find ourselves rocking the boat, then we're already in survival mode. And then when we have an argument, let's say, what we might do is we might back off, right? And even though there was no resolution to the argument, what we'll do is in our own minds, we'll make up a story to make the event that just happened okay. So think about, think about a woman who gets slapped in the mouth. Her husband walks in. She says, oh, my God, babe, where were you? And he looks at her and he wraps her in the mouth. What will happen is this is a painful event and the woman, the wife, will end up in her own head say, I shouldn't have asked him where he was. I shouldn't have said he was late. It's backwards rationalization to make the painful event okay. So that's why we have to pay attention to the situations in our life currently that are uncomfortable and that's why I teach you guys the one two three process constantly ask yourself how you feel because if you don't know how you feel and you don't stay anchored in the moment you have to start to learn to stay in your body um, because if you don't stay in your body you're not going to know how you feel and if you don't stay in your body then your mind is going to do what it can to make an uncomfortable situation okay and that's not okay um, maybe in a pinch that might help keep you calm you know um, this is what children do who suffer from Stockholm syndrome we make it okay that this is terrible things happening I think in certain situations that could actually be effective and necessary but for those of us who are not in dire situations, who find ourselves as codependents, who are, we are that frog in that pot of water that's heating up slowly, that's actually being, you know, cooked to death slowly, that's how most codependents live. For those of us who are in these chronic codependent dysfunctional relationships, whether they're with our siblings or with our parents or with our spouses or at work, or with our children, we have to start paying attention to the tension that's in our body because our brains have natural release valves. We dissociate. We use backwards rationalization. Like me as a kid, I pulled my hair out when I was a kid. It took me away. I counted on my fingers. I memorized license plates when I was a little girl. These are the things that I did to help me escape the tension in our body. So I just want to look at some of the comments you guys are posting right now. Um, Karen wrote, I used to always do this. I'm getting better because of you, Lisa. Um, Diane wrote, taking responsibility for my part. Um, 
Neil, I think it's Nell. Nell wrote, and there is no less pain. In fact, there is more because you have to get over doing that to yourself. Um, Jennifer wrote, yes, I find myself doing that. Um, Tracy, I'm, okay, so you guys are talking to each other. That's awesome. I'm so happy about that. So, um, what we do as abused adult children, and even what children do, is they fantasize out of the tension, right? So we have to understand that while that's a good thing, it's a good thing that we're able to have, we're able to have these pressure release valves happen, these pressure pressure releases where we do dissociate from time to time. I know for myself, if I didn't dissociate, if I didn't have these bizarre coping skills, I think I would have split. I really think that I might have had you know, a, a break, you know, and become schizophrenic or, you know, really something bad would have happened. I think that because I was able to find ways to escape, whether it was in writing or in fantasy, you know, dreaming about my prince, freaking Cinderella, hello. I was just talking about this with a client this morning, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty and all that crap. You know, if you're a mom or a dad, don't let your kids watch that stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, the later princesses are, are a lot more, um, a lot stronger as females, but this stuff waiting for a prince to come and all this subliminal programming about stepmothers hating their beautiful stepdaughters and, 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 the, and, the, and the stepdaughters hating, hating, the step, hating one another because they don't look the same and one is a little bit overweight. and It's just insane, all these subliminal messages. And the real message that I hate is that women should hate each other. I just, and we should wait for someone to come rescue us. It just, we have to rescue ourselves. And the other message little boys received, and plenty of little boys grew up watching Walt Disney too, you know, and all these Cinderella, Cinderella princess stories, is that the idea that princes were supposed to come and rescue the pretty girl. You don't even know her name. I don't even know your name. I want to marry you. I mean, there are a lot of male codependents. That's what they do. They're looking for a female to rescue. And unfortunately, you know what they attract? They attract problematic females. So we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We've got to heal this idea that we're separate. We're not. Creator exists within you. And your mother was supposed to connect to you. And the beautiful thing is you have the ability to connect to yourself. That's what this is about. We're healing this idea of separation. We are integrating mind, body, and soul. We're learning to stay in the body and stop separating from the body. Again, there's the theme. The narrative for today is learning how to heal this idea of separation and understanding a defense mechanism of the brain which is backwards rationalization. So the more you know about how your brain works, the better. Because if you understand what backwards rationalization is, the next time something happens to you, let's say you're, you have a son who's got a drug issue and you know that's horrible, so many of us struggle with that. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you had your bag, your pocketbook on the table and you had a hundred dollar bill in your wallet and your son went in to just use the bathroom then after he got in his car and he left you went back into the house you opened up your wallet and the hundred dollar bill is, is gone. What is normal, what will happen depending on how conscious you are and how codependent you are what will happen is a mom will freeze, which is a fear response, which is normal. <gasps> My son stole money from me. He might be going to pick up some heroin. He could end up overdosing. These are all very natural responses, right? But on our journey, it's our job to hold on to that, tra that, that trauma, that fight, flight, fight or flight response. Stay, when you stay in your body with it. Don't dissociate from it. Cognitively make a decision to stick with that feeling like what does this mean? What am I feeling? What am I feeling? What am I feeling? Stick with it. Anchor with it. What am I feeling? What am I feeling? Because if you don't, that sudden tension, your brain will naturally want to make it okay. Oh, he was hungry. Oh, maybe I really didn't have a hundred dollar bill in my bag. You know, maybe, maybe, Maybe the bank really didn't, maybe the bank didn't give me as much money as I thought when I went, went for that withdrawal. You know, maybe I lost it. You know, um, that's what will happen. And all those ideas, what they'll do is they'll help you relieve the tension in the moment. 
But to heal from codependency and to heal from narcissistic abuse, the challenge that we face is to learn how to stay in the body when in the current situation that we're in, we find ourselves full of anxiety or when we're working, like we're working in the program and those of you who have taken the 12 week program, you know that this was tough. You had to learn how to sit in your body when you remembered a memory that was all about a repressed trauma and a repressed energy. You know exactly how difficult it is to learn how to sit in the body when, those, when you connect a memory to a feeling. Sometimes we don't have the memory, we just have a feeling. And then what will happen is, and it's not our fault, you know, so many of us have gone to therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists behavioral therapists and alike and we sit there and what they do is they pay attention to our brains output okay but that's not where it's at dear one so if I walk into a therapist's office and I'm depressed and I start talking about uh, you know I just I'm not sure I really love my husband anymore and my kids are really on my nerves and I hate my job and oh my god I hate my mother and I really my brother just disgusts me, you know, it's just so annoying. Sounds like a typical codependent. You know, I hate my husband, I hate my mother, my brother's an idiot, you know, my kids get on my nerves, I hate my job. Those, that's what, that's how a codependent really feels. So, what happens is we go to a therapist's office saying this, and the therapist is, mm-hmm, 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 writing all this stuff down. And not all therapists, I have a lot of therapists that actually follow my work and are in my program and actually refer my books to the clients, which I think is awesome. You know, kudos to you, that is not a therapist that is high on their ego. They found something that actually works and they're worried about their clients. I think that's amazing, love that. Namaste to all of you. Um, but for the most part, so many of us have, have in the past and have our parents and, and grandparents have gone to traditional psychotherapists and alike, and everything that comes out of their mouth or your mouth gets written down. And what'll happen is, the doctor will pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth, right? And will treat the words and will treat the condition that's showing up and won't look under the hood for why I hate my husband, why my kids are on my nerves, why I hate my mother, why I can't stand my brother. And instead, will believe that this undercurrent of dissatisfaction for life is the reason I hate my husband, reason I hate my brother, reason I hate my... No! No, I said it this morning with the private client also. You know, when your car starts to make noise and you take it to the mechanic, the mechanic looks under the hood. <laughs> the mechanic looks under the hood. Hmm, let me look at the fan belt. Hmm, let me look at the carburetor. Hmm, let me look at this. And he tinkers around until the, the noise is gone. But what modern psychotherapy does, in most cases, a lot of cases, is that it really does pay attention to the brain output instead of the brain input. So we have to evolve as healing codependents and as people who are on the healing path who've been abused narcissistically. If you are depressed, that's normal. If you've been abused your whole life and you're dissatisfied with life, that's actually appropriate because you have to understand the brain input what goes in comes out, right? So you drink a gallon of water, you're going to urinate a gallon of water. And if you don't, you're retaining water and that means there's a problem. And then you go to a doctor, hopefully, and they do a bunch of tests on you and they find out that you've got a kidney issue. And then they clear up the kidney issue and suddenly you're urinating. Your input matches your output. So it, is, it just boggles my mind that when it comes to the emo emotions, the emotions that come out are the result of the emotions that went in. So if you find yourself depressed, what I want you to do is understand that what's coming out is a result of what went in. So children who grow up in happy homes who feel connected to their parents generally don't suffer from depression. Generally. I'm not saying that there can't be some brain chemistry issue. Can sometimes there are pituitary issues. Sometimes there are pituitary tumors that that are responsible for it. But generally speaking, if you come from a very well-adjusted concrete home that is full of love and full of fair rules, then what goes in will 
is what comes out. So if you come from a home where mommy is confident and she's able to set a boundary, you know, and she's, find, she's found the nice balance between divine feminine and divine male, so she can be sweet as well as strong. If that's your mother, then guess what? Guess what kind of a female you are in society? Nobody messes with you because you have found that beautiful balance because what goes in comes out. Repetition, observation, and consistency. What you experience. You have a mother or a grandmother or a grandfather that pulls, calls you a piece of shit. You're no good. You're good for nothing. You're useless. What goes in comes out. So whatever dialogue went in becomes the ticker tape in your mind. That is what the conscious field reads. That is what your ears and your brain hear. And that becomes your reality. Your internal reality, which then becomes your projected reality. Not your fault. This is the way the world was designed, and this is the way the brain was designed. That is not our fault. What all of you are learning to do under the guise of codependency recovery and narcissistic abuse recovery, what you are all learning to do is what all the greatest masters in the world have learned to do. What all the greatest teachers in the world are trying to teach, like Eckhart Tolle, 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 whatever, whatever. When I meet him one day, I will shake his hand and apologize for not saying his name correctly. And I'll ask for some clarification. Until then, I'm doing the best I can. So, anyway, what the greatest teachers on this planet that have ever, ever tried to teach, including Buddha and including Christ even, was that you are enough and you have control over what happens in your reality. Ask, believe, receive. As it is below, so shall it be above. I am, I consider myself the middle person. I'm trying to teach you how to do what Eckhart Tolle wants you to do. I'm trying to teach you what it is that Christ said we can do. I'm trying to teach you what so many gurus are trying to tell you you should be able to do. I get so frustrated when I listen to um, someone who has gained an a considerable amount of notoriety tell their followers that they should just be still they should just be one with their feelings they should just be I'm sorry but there's a whole rule book there's a whole lesson plan that we need to follow in order to just be Tell me how to just be. Tell me how to just be. So for those of you who have spent lots and lots and lots and lots of money trying to figure out, or just time and aggravation, if you've searched your whole life for trying to find this peace from within, you ain't crazy. <laughs> You're not crazy. There are a whole lot of people who may have found it and learned how to discover, you know, peace within and how to be content with the self and blah, 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 which is all nice. But if they're not teaching you how to achieve it, then I'm sorry, I'm just going to end up being frustrated. What do you, what do you guys think? I want to check now your comments. Oh, your Tara said, and you're that rule book. Um, and Misty loves my facial expressions. Wesley says, tell us, Lisa. Um... It's so re re relieving, yeah, to finally realize this is what my problem is and that I can now take steps to fix my reality and I finally see how the people I'm surrounded with are hurting me. Fiona said, preach. So um, Michelle wrote, guilty, had the need to be perfect because of the love I didn't have, not anymore. Mary said, yes, exactly. We need the tools we never were given as children in order to heal and better ourselves. Absolutely. Um, so, so. I have to, I want to read all your comments all day long, so I have to move this over so I don't get too distracted. Um, okay, so wait a minute. So Heather wrote, I know, Lisa, believe, I, I believe her mother is BPD, which is on the narcissist, narcissism spectrum. Is there any way for me to have a relationship with her without being triggered? Yes. You can have a relationship with people who, my parents, no longer trigger me. The, the, what we have to pay attention to, Tracy, is the idea that it's not about them, it's about us. We have to learn to observe them, and but, but we have to learn how to observe the self first. So if you recognize a trigger, it's up to you to be non-resistant to the trigger. So, for instance, 
for instance, a couple weeks back, my dad and my mom um, spent the weekend here because it was my youngest child's birthday. And my father's always been very, very critical of the way women look. Like, he is Don Juan, and I can assure you he is not. So, but even if he was, he wouldn't have the right to be critical of women, in my opinion. So anyway, so I'm running around, right, all day long. Um, I work a lot, and on top of that, I have my parents here, so now I'm catering to them, and then I have people coming over. So needless to say, I was a little tired. So in the afternoon, I sat down next to my father, and he looked at my hands, and I know I have veiny hands, but who the hell cares? I work for a living, right? And I clean my own damn house. Whatever, whatever, that's rude. But he says to me, boy, you've got some old lady-looking hands. So I just looked at my father and I thought to myself, wow, that would have triggered me 10 years ago. But it actually did not trigger me because I understand my father is on the narcissistic spectrum. He's definitely on that spectrum. And so because I'm able to pin the tail on the donkey, I don't have to react to his stupidity. So when you understand mom is BPD, right, you have to understand that you're trying to have a relationship, which a relationship goes both ways, right? And a relationship looks like the infinity symbol. When you are in a relationship with someone who's BPD, there's no such thing as an infinity symbol. There's just information and data being spewed out of their mouth, and it means nothing. And the more wounded you are, the more those words, they're like bombs, the more they are able to land in our heart space. When you're able to put up a protective shield and say, Mom has BPD, Mom says stupid shit, Mom is below the veil of consciousness, Mom is running her mouth and running her programming, that's not even my mother. This is, this is an alien. This is somebody who is under the veil of darkness, and she doesn't even know who she is, and she's probably a product of her programming. When you're able to think those types of thoughts, you come from love and light, and it's no longer necessary to even judge your mother. But I have to say, we all have to spend time on this hill where we're able to point our finger and say, my mother did that, my mother did that, my father did that, my brother sexually abused me, my brother said this, my sister did that, she stole my boyfriend, she slept with my husband, whatever. We all have to be able to stand on that hill and be able to identify those people outside of ourselves that hurt us. That's where this idea of separation is actually necessary, okay? Because the first healing that you have to experience, the first integration that you need to be experiencing is the integration with self. So when you're wounded and you're seeking external validation, you are literally this poor puppy who has an abusive master pulling him around by the neck. When you wake up and you realize that you are divine in your child and you don't have to like a poor puppy that's defenseless. You're not a poor puppy that's defenseless. You're a human being and creator is within you. The dog will never know that. The puppy will never know that. That's what separates man from beast, is that we have consciousness. We have the ability to tap into consciousness. We have the ability, the ability to remember and to awaken to our own divinity, whereas an animal does not, ha does not have that ability, or at least we don't know. A butterfly might believe it's divinity. We don't know. Um, so it's really, really important that we understand that the first integration that needs to take place is the one that we have to have with the self. The psyche must understand that there is a divine inner child that needs to be recognized. So the mirror neurons that were supposed to be turned on by the people outside of us that weren't, we have to learn to turn the mirror neurons on ourselves. Um, so. Um, Dr. Dag, he said, I really, need, I really need people who went through the same stuff. It's so frustrating to speak to healthy ones who just don't get it. Um, dear ones, dear ones, dear ones, correct that thinking, Dr. Daggy. It's frustrating to talk to healthy ones that just don't get it. A healthy person would get what you were saying. A healthy person would understand where you were coming from because a healthy person has the ability to have empathy and to walk around in your shoes and to imagine what life is like you, like for you. So unhealthy people, you need to correct that. Get the iron out. Consider Lisa Romano's big mouth and iron here. Um, people who don't validate you, in my opinion, are unhealthy. 
we should really be able to validate almost anybody's experience. So that doesn't mean that um, you have to agree with the person. You know, um, my daughter, my one daughter um, experiences road rage, you know, and I don't agree with that. But when I imagine what it's like to be her and she's late for work and she's hungry and she had two cups of coffee before work, I imagine her body has had double the caffeine it should, hasn't had anything to eat. I imagine her blood sugar is low. So now I know that the, the, the foot is on the, the pedal in her brain and she's frustrated because she is a good worker and she wants to get on time. So when she talks to me about her road rage, I'm able to validate her. I can understand how that must feel for you. So, um, I'm just reading some of your com comments. Right, Nell wrote, I agree Lisa, and we don't have to have lived through what they did to have empathy. No, that's a healthy, they can have empathy, but they'll never fully get it. Okay, that's true. That's, that's possibly true. And that's why it is healthy to seek out forums like this and people who have been as abused as you have because we absolutely need the validation. So many of us, and I think that's why so many of you click with my work, my work, because you're feeling seen and you're feeling validated, and I'm so happy about that. Because what'll happen is, because someone like, someone like me that's been through what I've been through, you recognize, understands your pain. And so when I, when I start talking, you feel seen. Like, wow, this girl gets me. And it's beautiful because you don't feel so alone anymore. You and I never have to meet. You, we don't ever have to meet any of the people on the, in this chat right now. 117 people are, are watching live right now. We never have to meet one another. But we do know that other people are out there and experience our pain. And that helps us turn mirror neurons off. And Shelley wrote, please explain the difference between rationalization and trying to understand the other person's experience. Understanding how, how someone else feels is different than rationalizing our own pain. So it, there is a fine line, Shelley. I totally get it. But you'd have to give me an actual, um, an actual scenario to break down. So let's say, let's say we go back to this, this, this housewife situation, right? So Luann from Housewives of New York, poor Luann, is engaged to this man who is caught making out with a woman in a hotel lobby and they take snap a picture. Luann is presented with this picture. Luann has this, <gasps> how could this be, ha this panic feeling comes over her, right? And there's sudden fear. So now, instead of staying with her body, staying, sticking with her body and following it through, should, should my fiance be making out with another woman? No. Where is your boundary? What are your boundaries? I don't know if she actually went through that type of thinking process, whatever, but when she discussed it, her answer was, right away, he was drunk. So she was excusing what she experienced and making what she experienced okay because she didn't, maybe couldn't deal with it and the fear of losing him, you know, was, was um, ranked higher than confronting it. So remember, whatever we associate pain with, the brain is going to want to avoid. So she may, if your ego is very strong, and I'm not saying that was, that's, the, that's it, but she does look like she has a strong ego. So if her ego is very strong, she doesn't want to be wrong, she doesn't want to be embarrassed publicly, you know, she doesn't want to, to, to have egg on her face when it comes to the other women. So she rationalizes backwards, because the event already happened, for why she felt what she felt. So... Let's say you have, um, and understand this, when you're having an issue with someone else, you have to be looking for that, good, Shelly said that makes total sense. Um, so, I hope that I understand, I'm not happy, okay. So anyway, uh, sorry dear ones, it's very distracting, I'm going to move my, move my board over. So... It's very important that we understand as codependents, it's beautiful to have empathy for other people. Beautiful. And that's usually one of our qualities, like right off the bat. It's beautiful to be able to forgive. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to be able to be understanding. It's beautiful to be able to want to hear what other people say. Okay? Those, 
that's like three blocks of gold right there. Seriously, you have to know that those qualities are valuable. So I want you to imagine that your heart is literally solid gold. It's made of solid gold. And you have to understand that other people find your ability to forgive them and have empathy for them and to be forgiving. Oh, I think I said that already. But to have empathy, to be forgiving, to be kind. Other people are going to find that commodity very, very valuable. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there that will abuse that. Just like if you let, left three bars of gold on the sidewalk outside of your house or on your, we call it a stoop in New York. But, you know, if you left three blocks of gold in the street, anybody that walks by is going to steal that gold because it's valuable, right? You have to understand that when it comes to human relationships, being forgiven, having someone who's understanding, having somebody who's empathetic, is like finding blocks of gold on the street. Especially if you're somebody who is poor of heart. So think about how valuable a block of gold is to someone who's poor. They're going to want to steal it. They're going to want to take it because they don't own it. Now, imagine what would happen if somebody walked past those three bars of gold and they had three bars of gold in their pocket. They, wouldn't, they probably wouldn't feel the need to steal it like somebody who lacked that type of gold, that lacked that type of, those types of characteristics. So that's sort of the dynamic that's at play where a codependent has and a narcissist lacks. And so it's also very, you have to also understand that codependence and codependence, people on the codependent spectrum and people on the, the narcissistic spectrum feel a sense of lack. But this is the thing about a codependent. A codependent does have love to give. A codependent does have empathy to give. So understand that you attract narcissists not because you're a narcissist, but you attract narcissists because there's a lack in you for self. You don't give your, your three bars of gold or your gold to yourself. You always give it away. So that's where the lack comes from. This is the really cool thing. When you start accepting that, that your heart is made of gold and you start protecting it and you start owning it, guess what? You're no longer in a lack vibration and you will no longer attract narcissists. Now, this is the thing. For those of you who are in relationships right now, as you begin to start honoring and loving your gold heart and you start protecting it, the relationships in your life will get very, very rocky because energetically they're just not even anymore. And unfortunately, people who are on the narcissistic spectrum, they feel you pulling away and their, their goal is to pull you back down. So again, dear ones, this is when you have to really take the lessons that I'm trying to teach you and learn to stay in your body and learn to feel your feelings. Accept how I feel, feel what I feel, and then make a decision about what I want to do about it. Sometimes the decision is to not do anything. Sometimes the decision is to not speak to this person. Sometimes the decision is to go take a bath. Sometimes the decision is to go meditate. Sometimes the decision is to go write and journal about how you're feeling. Sometimes the decision is to go buy yourself a new candle. I've got mine burning behind me somewhere, somewhere, wherever it is. It's there. Trust me. It smells beautiful in this room, like gardenias. It's just beautiful. But anyway, so um, in let's the big lots and lots of takeaways today. I, I encourage you guys to watch this video a couple of times because we ran through a lot of really good lessons. We talked about, about backwards rationalization. Um, I wanted to hit on cognitive dissonance. I'll do that in another live stream. We talked about the idea of separation, how this idea, this concept of us feeling separate from our mothers and separate from whatever God you were taught to believe in, separate from community, separate from other people, what we first have to, is separate from self. And then what ends up happening is remember, what goes in comes out. So if there was separation came in, meaning your experience was separation, then you're going to have a separation of self on the inside. So the first order of business is to use your cognitive brain to help you heal. Use meditation. Slow the mental chatter. The mental, mental chatter is a bunch of bullshit anyway. 
<laughs> the mental chatter is a bunch of programming, dear ones, right? You get that? Um, I don't know if I'm a genius, Karen. Karen says, Lisa, you're a genius. Um, I don't know if I'm a genius as much as I am somebody who never gave up. You know, I, I stuck. I got really pissed off when I realized that the mental chatter wasn't mine. And it was programmed into me when I was a little kid. And I got really angry about that. Because that meant the life that I was living that was so unhappy wasn't mine. And that really pissed me off. So, I don't know if as much as it is a genius as it is about being tenacious and about being angry and absolutely w loving my children so much that I wanted to re I wanted to fix whatever this was so they my children didn't have to live the um, life I lived Sharon just wrote Sharon Sharon wrote Lisa you're a champion Sharon my maiden name is champion I'm not kidding I don't know if you knew that but my maiden name is actually champion so it's kind of profound that you just wrote that um, and I'm not kidding um, Romano was actually my, my first husband's my first husband's name um, so dear ones this concludes our live stream I promise you um, yes and it was crazy hard work um, so I promise you that that's so funny Sharon wrote I didn't know that yeah that's pretty cool Sharon um, so I promise you, dear ones, that these live streams, I will get better and better at them. I'm using, I don't even know what they're called. I'm using two different sy operating systems, I guess. They are servers. I uh, No, not servers. Whatever. Encoders. I think they're encoders. I have one, enco one encoder for my new website, and I have another encoder for YouTube. So, but I will, I really will get this done. So, um, dear ones, in the... Um, um, you will manifest a good man like I did, but you, you've got to become the partner you want to attract, okay? You have to become the, the person of integrity, the person of character, the person of self-love, the person of truth, the person of wisdom. I love you too. Um, you have to become that person, and then you will attract your equal. It's so cool. Um, is it best for us to try and stay on the YouTube channel on the day of the stream? Um, yes, that's fine. Absolutely, you can you can stay on the you can stay on the YouTube stream. I have to figure some stuff out, Deanna. It's it's um, Dina. It's really not your fault. I will figure this out. So I want to say thank you guys for watching. Um, yes, you have um, a great night. I want to say good night to Mary, Karen, Nell, Diana, Brandy, Tabarin, um, Gamma. Sharon, Nilger, Nilgen, yes, you can watch later. It has to process. Um, much love to you guys, Michelle, Brooke, Gypsy Julie, what a cool name. Tia, Tia Love. Um, I just wanted Mary Kay, I know you're on the line. Tracy, Dr. Daggy, thanks for watching. And um, I'll see you, I'll see you next week, dear ones. Namaste. I bow to the love and the light in you. Bye.